Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Sanjot Mahendale, and on behalf of the Tang Center for Silk Road Studies, I want to welcome you to our second to last lecture of the spring semester. Now, next Friday at 3.30 p.m., Judith Lerner of the Institute for the Study of the Ancient World at NYU will be in Berkeley, personally, to give a talk titled The Cemetery at Yihe Nur, Inner Mongolia and its connections with the Northern Wei Dynasty and with Central Asia. Now that lecture will take, take place in our conference room at uh, 1995 University Avenue in, in Berkeley. It's an in-person talk, but we will be recording it for viewing after the fact. Now, before I introduce uh, our speaker today, I want to remind everyone to please submit your questions through the Q&A function and not the chat, which is reserved for technical issues. Um, so back to our speaker. Uh, welcome, Franz. Let's see if you pop up magically. Um, Hello. There you are. <laughs> there you are. Uh, Hello, good everybody. to see you. Um, great to see you, actually, albeit once again on Zoom. Uh, this is the third lecture you are giving uh, for us since December when you participated in the Gandhara workshop, uh, and the second actually co-sponsored by the Collège de France. Uh, so for those of you who weren't present at the previous occasions, I'm very happy to introduce you once again. Uh, France graduated from the École Normale Supérieure in Paris in 1977 and became deputy director of the French archaeological delegation in Afghanistan until 1981, uh, where he worked at the ancient site of Aichanum under the directorship of the late Professor Paul Bernard. He returned to Afghanistan several times between 2004 and I believe 2012 to work on several other projects. From 1981 to 2013, he was researcher at the Centre National de la Recherche Scientifique in Paris, and from 1989 to 2014, director of the French Uzbek Archaeological Mission in Sogdiana, which worked primarily at Samarkand. Uh, from 1999 to 2014, he held a professorship at the École Pratique des Hautes Études in Paris, where he chaired the Department Religions of the Ancient Iranian World. In 2013, he was appointed professor at the Collège de France, where he chairs the Department History and Cultures of Pre-Islamic Central Asia. He has a long list of publications, including seven edited and co -ed or co-edited volumes and some 230 articles that focus on the art and archaeology of Central Asia, Sogdiana, Zoroastrianism, among others. Uh, in preparation is the volume Early Sogdian Inscriptions and Documents, uh, which he co-edited with Nicholas, or co-wrote with Nicholas Sims Williams. Uh, he just told me in our pre-chat uh, that uh, he has been elected to the Académie Française. Um, no, the French Academy. Sorry, Académie. sorry, sorry. I made him. Académie I did a literal French translation. Académie des Inscriptions. et Belles Lettres. Yes. yes. Sorry. Uh, that would have been fantastic too if you had been elected uh, to that institution as well. Um, so today, um, uh, France is joining us uh, to talk about uh, some of his recent research uh, on the image of Alexander the Great in Central Asia. Uh, so welcome, France. Hello, uh, hello everybody. Uh, yes, uh, it, this is my uh, third lecture. And uh, in my previous lecture, I um, was dealing with uh, uh, the art and archaeology of uh, a particular region in Central Asia, Khorezm, uh, the northern region uh, to the, on the shore of the Aral Sea, uh, uh, where uh, and uh, I focused on the new discoveries concerning the origins of Zoroastrian art. And now I'm moving more southward to the historical regions of. Sogdiana, now in Uzbekistan, Bactria, now shared between Afghanistan uh, and uh, Uzbekistan and Tajikistan. Uh, and uh, to a uh, la later period, mainly the first centuries 
uh, uh, for era uh, when the figure of Alexander um, underwent uh, experienced uh, uh, an, uh, uh, an extremely uh, strange. Uh, uh, certainly puzzling revival in these countries. What I'm going to present today uh, is the result of a uh, joint work with my colleague uh, Ankada, Dr. Ankadan from the Centre National de la Recherche Scientifique. Uh, this is co-published. Uh, this, uh, this work uh, is and will be co-published. Alexander the Great, known in Arabic and Persian as Al Sikandar, or just Sikandar, was vividly remembered in Central Asian traditions and literatures, even before his story was popularized everywhere in the Iranian world by Ferdowsi's Book of Kings, Shahnameh. Alexander remained lo celebrated locally as the founder of several cities, Merv, Balkh, Termes, Samarkand, which he or his successor had indeed refortified. Contrary to the negative image of Alexander preserved in the Zoroastrian literature, he appears to have kept there a positive image, especially as a model for the nomadic rulers who emulated him in their conquests in India. Ankadan and I have recent, recently restudied several iconographic documents, mainly an illustrated silver bowl which had belonged to an aristocratic family from Lhasa and was, was published in 1973 by Philip Denwood. To our great surprise, we discovered that it is a Jewish, Jewish work shedding new light on the importance of Jewish communities in sixth century Central Asia and their appropriation of the figure of Alexander. But before examining this object, I would like to present other pieces of evidence. Some have a modest character, but are nevertheless very significant as an indication of Alexander's long-lasting long popularity in Central Asia and especially in Samarkand. This is a series of terracotta images here, produced from the fifth to the seventh century and whose head was, whose head was cast from older molds. These terracottas were found only at Afrasiab, the site of ancient Samarkand. More than 140 specimens were discovered there and only there, constituting a substantial part of the local terracotta repertoire. Together with Heracles, Athena, and Satyrs, this is the only Greek character that remains recognizable. Despite the permanent remodeling of the head, despite the permanent remodeling of the head covers and hair, at least four types could go back to Hellenistic models. Some juvenile, juvenile figures here carry um, a worn out head cover, the rest of the lion head, and they recall Macedonian uh, types of the young Alexander, like the ivory head uh, from, um, uh, from the Virginia tomb uh, or Alexander on the sarcophagus of the King of Sidon, now in the Istanbul Archaeological Museum. Two other types here and here can be related to the adult Alexander. One type recalls Lysippus portrait uh, with the turned neck slightly bent to the left, and with the melting glance of the eyes looking upwards, here and here. Statues in Pella and Alexandria provide good parallels. The last type of terracottas from Afrasiab has a square face, long wavy hair on the sides, a long nose separated from the fleshy lips, and large deep eyes, 
one can compare it with early Hellenistic representation from Athens or Priene. Unfortunately, we do not know if here Alexander's characteristic hairdo with raised locks on his forehead at the anastole, visible here, ever existed on any of the Samarkand terracottas as their matrix was blunt at that place. In fact, these images were repeatedly recast, touched up, stamped on various object, objects, usheries, independent figures completed as praying people, musicians, horsemen, or mace bearers, fitted with a Phrygian cap or a beard, etc. The original molds were possibly taken from Greek statuettes depicting Alexander, like this bronze statuette from Begram, now in the Kabul Museum. It is very tempting to suppose that in Samarkand, this image could still have been identified as Alexander precisely at a time when he was still locally remembered as the founder of the city and of its temple to the goddess Nana, as witnessed by the Syriac version of the Alexander romance in the 6th century. Alexander's image can also be tentatively recognized on the bowl from Vereno kept at the Hermitage Museum and to be dated in the fifth century or so. The position of the hunters recall the heroic Macedonian, there are three hunters. They recall the heroic Macedonian horsemen with royal headbands. Some of them clearly identified with Alexander the Great on uh, other works of art. Besides the Sidon sarcophagus, several statuettes representing Alexander on his horse were tentatively linked to the texts narrating his famous hands and the monuments they, inspri they inspired. Relevant for this reading of the, of the Vereno vase uh, are uh, the bronze statuettes from Begram, uh, already shown here, and a bronze statuette from Herculanum, representing Alexander as a horseman who hunts with a spear. The vase, the very new vase, shows uh, two hunting scenes. On top, a figure with royal headband is killing a tiger, which puts him in great danger. Reputed for his agility and power, the tiger was said to have the strength of two lions, as stated by Megasthenes, the envoy of Seleucus to India. And indeed, on the opposite side of the bowl, a lion in a swift movement that makes him seem double-headed faces the arrows of two horsemen. Uh, and as, as, these, as these two horsemen uh, are uh, hunting with, uh, um, with, uh, uh, with a bow, and uh, uh, are hunting the same animal and not just one, they are probably on lower status than the one on top. Uh, we have no direct access to the vase yet, enabling us to ascertain our identification of uh, these two hunt hunters with well-known uh, hunt companions of Alexander. In any case, the hunting of big cats in the Achaemenid's closed gardens, Paradisoi, was reportedly one of the favorite distractions of Alexander, clad in the Persian costume. The very no vase in particular could recall the manifestation of the royal power during the famous hunting at Bazaira near Samarkand, when Alexander invoked his royal privilege to kill the beast with a spear and he would have done it only with one hit as it appears on the face. It is true that the only author who describes this hunt, Curtius Rufus, mentions no tiger, but a lion of rare dimensions. Yet the confusion between the tiger and an exceptional lion is not impossible since the two animals now extinct in Iran and Central Asia could be confused. The Persian lion had little mane, 
on the Oxus Tiger, a less visible stripping, as I could observe on the last one killed in 1973 in Jorez and taxidermized in the Nucus Museum. In fact, for a long time, the Greeks and Romans had no coherent image and name for the tiger. Aristotle identifies it with the man-eater mentioned by Ctesias, while in the first century BC, Varro defines the tiger as a kind of variegated lion which had never been captured alive. It is therefore possible that the memory of a tiger hunt near Samar was blurred in the Western traditions, but remained vivid in Sogdiana, where tigers still existed in the 1950s. Now to the main topic of this lecture. David Snellgrove, professor of Tibetan Buddhist studies at SOAS in London, obtained this bowl in 1961 from a member of an old aristocratic family in Lhasa, who declared it a generation's old family heirloom. Philip Denwood published it in 1973, while it was on loan in the Ashmolean Museum. It now belongs to an anonymous owner in Japan who displays it in the Ancient Orient Museum in Tokyo. As we have not yet been able to see the bowl, Ankadan and I follow Denwood's description, comparing it with the new photographs provided by the museum. The bowl is shaped as a calotte, as a calotte cup, 6.5 centimeters high, with a rim diameter of 21 centimeters. Its weight is uh, 1 kilo point 34. Thanks to the work of Nicholas Sims Williams, we know that this weight corresponds to 250 drachms, according to a local unit well attested in Bactria and Sogdiana, being in this case 4.5 grams. As this standard could not be known before Sims Williams' research, and given the round number of local drugs used for the vase, we exclude all suspicion that the object is a fake. The interior surface is smooth. The exterior is fully decorated with cast reliefs encrusted in the vase, as can be seen, for example, here, uh, in order to form complex shapes projecting outside the wall. Several incrustations are clearly visible on the pictures. Small parts of the surface of the shell were sunken. The slight ridges of each cutting were hammered over the edges of the added pieces. Some details were chiseled after the insertion of the cast pieces. No certain traces of gilding can be observed in the, on the photographs, although it probably existed at least on some parts of the background. The bottom, here and enlarged here, is occupied by a medallion showing a round pool where six fish swim in different directions. On the body, six characters are distributed at regular intervals. In fact, they correspond only to four matrices as two are duplicated. The characters carry various objects and each acts in relation with a tree with multiple and twisted branches. A large snake crawls up each tree, attacking a nest in which birds appear at different stages of their animal life, hatching the eggs as a couple, feeding and protecting two fledgings that are at first frightened, and then eaten by the snake, as one can deduce from the empty nest. Two figures, mirror images of each other, appear on either side of the tree. The figure on the left drinks from a cup. The one on the right makes a gesture towards the tree. They are nude, except for a wavering scarf thrown off the on the shoulders of the one on the left here, and a kind of broad cloak on the one on the right. 
only the figure wearing a scarf is repeated in another section. There are two other characters well differentiated. One, also depicted twice, wears a skirt and carries a fluted and fora on his shoulder. The other, dressed in a short tunic, strikes a drum with a stick while sketching a dance step with his feet. His head seems bald, but a strange appendix hangs on the right side, the only one which is visible. <laughs> Denwood recognizes that the bowl illustrates a Greek subject. <clears throat> We follow him on this, but only on this. For him, the key was a repeated motif of the snake attacking birds in the nest, which he recognized as the famous prodigy that happened at Olis before the Achaean army embarked for the Trojan War. There, a snake crawled on a plain tree near the sacred spring in Artemis sanctuary and devoured eight fledgings, then their mother, after which it, 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 it turned to stone. The seer Calchas interpreted this as the prediction of nine years of war. This identification, although never openly refuted, manifestly failed to be convincing for good reasons. The tree is not a plain tree. Known of the participant in the Homeric scene, Calchas, Agamemnon, and Ulysses can be recognized. Moreover, the number of eight fledgings plus their mother, without which the omen loses all its significance, is found neither in the whole composition nor in the individual scenes. At this stage of my presentation, it is appropriate to place this vessel in the series it belongs to. This series, now represented by 20 vessels or so, is the Bactrian Bones, a notion that was introduced by Kurt Weizmann he's in, he's in his groundbreaking article, Three Bactrian Silver Vessels with Illustrations from, from Euripides, published in 1943. Later on, Boris Marchak, curator at the Hermitage Museum and director of the excavations at Penjikent, considerably expanded this group by including objects partly decorated with classical subjects or without any classical subject at all. These objects were kept mainly at the Hermitage and in other Soviet museums. Marshak's other decisive contribution was a revision of the chronology. Weizmann had attributed the group to the Greco-Bactrian kingdom or the early Kushans, uh, I quote him, between 250 BC and 100 CE. Marshak, on the basis of local subjects inserted into almost each vessel with figures, put the main group in the 4th, 5th century CE, not excluding the possibility of later dates for some specimens, including the one discussed here. This global time, sp this global time span coincides with uh, several post-Kushan polities. Kushano Sasanians, about 280 to 400. The Kiderites, 420 to 470. Well, according to me, because there are other estimates. The Heftalites, 460 to 460. The last two dynasties, Kiderites and Heftalites, supposedly originated from the so-called Hunnish invaders of the fourth century. Within the series of uh, a few bowls, within the series, a few bowls can be dated quite precisely to the early Heftalite period, last third of the fifth century, by the comparison of the of their rulers' crown types with those represented on coins. The bowl under consideration presents strong original features. Contrary to many other Sassanian, Bactrian, or, or Sogdian vessels showing trees or vine scrolls in narrative scenes, 
the trees of the La Sable not only frame the individual characters, but are objects of their actions. Altogether, together with the fish, the, these trees are one of the keys to the board's interpretation. They all bear three oversized flowers, which then would compare to lotuses. But in fact, at the La Sable, we are not dealing with lotuses, but with open or half open flowers of Boswellia serrata, in Sanskrit chalaki, the tree or bush that produces Indian frankincense known as kundura. You can see here the incense uh, exuding. Um, the shellaki, the shellaki is already mentioned in the Ayurveda for its medical properties. Interestingly enough, kundura is the origin of the Pahlavi and Persian word for frankincense, kundur, which shows that India was in competition with Arabia, one of the sources of the frankincense used in Persia and probably also in Central Asia. The resin, the resin exudes from the bark solidifies and it is collected in the shape of small balls. The snakes, stories of uh, um, uh, can see the snake for here. Uh, stories of snakes guarding aromatics in faraway countries were often told by the Greeks. They are commonplace in Sanskrit tales and they are also told in Chinese and Arabic accounts on India. Among the four characters, each repeated to, um, among the four, the four characters, the bar-chested young man with an amphora has a wavering skir noted at the waist, which could well be a free rendering of the Indian dhoti. He appears in complete profile with sloping forehead, a snub nose, and thick lips, none of which conforms to classical canons. His long, untrimmed hair is brushed to the back. On his right shoulder, he carries a small amphora with a high, narrow neck, a fluted body, and a flat foot. Similar specimens of about 20 centimeters high are known in Penjikent. Boris Marshak discussed at length possible models of these clay vessels, and in the absence of Sassanian intermediaries, he concluded that they were probably inspired by late Roman small and forest appearing in about 400 AD and imported into Sogdiana through countries north of the Black Sea. Recently, an image of a quite similar amphora has been discovered in Paikent, near Bukhara, on a painting attributed to the 5th or 6th century. A second male figure, to, for whom Dan would propose only a general Eastern attribution, is ready to beat a drum and direct his piercing glance towards the snake and the nest. He wears a full tunic with loose sleeves rolled to the elbow. The motion of his bare feet seems to indicate that he is trampling the ground in order to add uh, to the vibrations, a motion that is visible at the bottom end of his tunic. The drum held firmly under the left arm is biconical, is biconical, biconical, with a lozenge network of strings that the musician pinches with his hand. The shape of drum is sometimes depicted in Sassanian silverware. Nonetheless, uh, there it is never beaten, and, and it is not beaten either on the Bactrian so-called stroganoff bowl, where it is played by two Indian macaques. Indeed, this instrument is more typical of India, where this drum is known in Punjab as the doll and is beaten on the bass side with a curved stick. Here, a depiction on the Barhut Stupa. Uh, 
the drum, the Indian drum is sometimes a plain barrel, sometimes it has a hourglass shape with sticks very similar to, or, to those on our vase. The image on the barrel stupa and on the vase are almost identical. Consequently, this character can be identified as an Indian musician or a priest musician who is called in order to divert the danger of the snake from the collectors of, arom of aromatics or from the fledgings or from both. This priest musician has indeed a strange characteristic, a large hairy appendix on the right side of his shaven head. The other side is not visible. Initially, we contemplated the possibility of a tuft of hair, the hikka, still worn at the back or on the side of the chef's skull by some Brahmanic castes in South India. They are, however, generally smaller and different in shape. Moreover, the character's face is grotesque, with round eyes set um, with folds of skin, a protruding nose and lips, rather evocative of a monstrous creature with ape-like features. We are inclined to recognize him as a fictional character uh, with a fully human body and a head inspired by a sinus sinocephalus. The type of the sinocephalus baboon could in this case be mixed with that of the Indian macaque drummer, more familiar in Battery and Sojana, and exemplified by the musician on the Strogon of Bowl. Later, I shall consider the literary connections of this figure. We are now left with the main figures. Two nude males standing on either side of the tree. Only the one to the left is repeated elsewhere in the ring composition. Except for a scarf and a cloak, each is nude and stands so that one can see that the bows are circumcised. This is a unique feature in classical as well as Iranian and Central Asian art. Provocative nudity is in itself unusual in the Iranian repertoire. The young man on the right holds a sack on his left hand and extends his closed right hand. He is about to collect the resin of the tree, which exudes from an incision. And you can, com you can compare the actual photograph of the Boswellia serrati uh, shallaki tree. The young man on the left holds a kind of bottle in his right arm. Here. While in his right hand, uh, no, he, he, uh, no, no, he, he holds a kind of bottle in his left arm while lifting a cup in his right hand. The bottle has a long, narrow neck on a globular body on a wider conical foot. This general shape, well known in late antiquity as pilgrim bottles, which were used to carry holy water, is attested from Hellenistic times onwards. Ring handles on a globe, ring, um, uh, ring handles on a globular body with oblique uh, striations are attested for mold brown flagons from layers of the fourth century in Egypt. Most probably, the young man uses the bottle uh, to sprinkle a liquid which can drip from a lid on the mouth or from drills pierced on the bottom. Both variants are attested from actual specimens. The other vessel, a cup of a local type with palmettes, is read, raised to the level of the mouth, obviously in order to drink, you can compare with this one. Shown in a three quarter of you, the heads of both young men on each side of the tree 
are like their bodies, mirror images of each other. In contrast with the other figures, they conform to the classical canon. The hair is short and abundant, fashioned into triangular locks and parted raised locks in the, above the middle of the forehead. This feature, as well as the delineation of the faces, definitely points to Alexander. The role played by the figure to the right of the tree corresponds closely to an episode in the Greek and Latin texts of the Alexander Romance. The visit of Alexander to an Indian sacred wood, abode of the oracular tree of the sun and moon. This episode is told in, uh, the, in, in, in the so-called letter to Aristotle about the miracles of India, inserted in uh, one of the versions of the romance. And I read, read the text. The grove was luxuriant, full of frankincense and balsamum. The priest ordered my friend standing nearby and about 300 of my fellow soldiers to take off their rings and all their clothes as well as their shoes. I began walking through the whole grove and I saw that balsamum, which had a very good odor, was dripping profusely from all the branches of the tree, which were everywhere. Taken by the odor of it, I tore away lumps from the bark. This is exactly what we, what we see here. This explains why Alexander is nude and without a weapon. The other figure, made from the same mold as Alexander, as the other Alexander, drinks from a cup while holding an aspergillum. But in the above quoted text, no drinking, no libation, no ablution are taking place in the garden and the priest forbids any sacrifice. It appears therefore that this second figure is taken from another episode, which also takes place in a perfumed atmosphere. This episode is the discovery of the fountain of life during the unsuccessful march to the country of the blessed by the army of Alexander. And at this point, it is necessary to draw attention again to the image of the pool of water full of fish that appears at the bottom of the bowl. Fish play a decisive part in this episode. For in the main Greek versions, the miraculous quality of the fountain is discovered by Alexander's cook when he, washed, when he washes dried fish, which are then revived by the water. I quote the text, the passage. The cook took a dried fish and waded into the clear water of the spring to wash it. As soon as it was dipped in the water, it came to life and leapt out of the cook's hands. He was frightened and did not tell me what had happened. Instead, he drank some of the water himself and scooped some in a silver vessel and kept it. In the late antique and medieval traditions of the romance, there are several versions of the episode of the Fountain of Life, including the drinking of the reviving water, plus in some cases, ablution or bath, bath, bathing. The difficulty arises from the various identities of the character who performs them. In the above cited Greek version, the cook, the cook drinks after he has understood the miraculous properties of the water, and he keeps some in a silver container for himself. Later on, he informs Alexander only of his discovery, not of his appropriation of the water. At first glance, it could correspond to our image, but this drinker cannot be the cook. The cook is a man of low status, by no means an alter ego of Alexander. In other Greek versions, the cook does nothing after having witnessed the miracle. Uh, let us try to look in the later Persian tradition. In this tradition, there is no cook and his function is transferred to Khizr, a prophetic figure. 
who actually drinks and washes himself in the spring. I quote here a Ferdowsi Shahname. On the third night, two ways appeared in the dark, and his lost sight of the king. The prophet reached the water of life. He stretched the end of his lifetime towards Saturn. In the clear water, he washed his head and body, looking for no other than the pure God as a protector. He drank, rested, quickly went back. His praise was constantly increased by his homage to God. This is indeed very close to our image. In Ferdus's version, the drinking and ablution are performed by a prophet, equal in status to Alexander. Uh, in the later Persian poem Iskandar Nome by Nizomi, Khizr discovering, discovering the magic pool is associated with Elias, another prophet, as shown by this Persian miniature. But of course, the young man on our bowl cannot be Khizr, because Khizr first appears in the Quran, in the Surah of the Cave, as the unnamed servant of Moses. So, who is this man? There is one version of the romance in which the prophetic character assuming this role is Alexander himself, the Jewish version. In the transmitted material, this version is attested by two sources. One is an Aramaic passage in the Talmud of Babylon, a Talmud of Babylon, a compendium of oral traditions and rabbinic opinions compiled, compiled in the fourth, six centuries, and thus contemporary with the ancient Greek, Armenian, and Syriac witnesses of the romance. The other version is a text published and carefully translated by Rosalie Reich as Tales of Alexander the Macedonian. This is part of a Hebrew manuscript in Oxford, which reproduces a collection of texts of various dates, ultimately compiled in, compiled in the 14th century. Despite having been recorded several centuries from each other at the opposite end of the Mediterranean, both texts appear to reflect a similar, a similar set of narratives. The Talmudic passa passage runs as follows. Uh, when Alexander took himself and went on his way, he sat at a certain spring and was eating bread. He had salted fish in his hands, and while he cleansed them of their excessive salt, a particularly pleasant fragrance fell upon them. Alexander said to himself, I may conclude from this event that this spring comes from the Garden of Eden. There are those who say he took from those waters and washed his face. And there are those who say he ascended along the length of the entire spring, spring he ascended along the length of the entire spring until he reached the entrance of the Garden of Eden. He raised a loud voice, calling out, open the gate for me. The sentry of the Garden of Eden said to him, this is the gate of the Lord. The writers shall enter into it. So Alexander is not admitted, but in compensation, he's presented with a precious token shaped like an eyeball. And now here is the narrative in the tales of Alexander. They set forth from there, arriving at the land of the Euphrates. The king ordered wells dug in the vicinity of the river, and much water was found, and the king and his men drank. On the tenth day, the king's hunter caught some birds, wrung their necks, and washed them in the waters of the river. As he dipped them in and washed them in waters of the river, they returned to life and flew away. Seeing this, the, quick, the king's servant quickly drank from that river and went to the king to tell him all that had happened. Obviously, these are the waters of the Garden of Eden, said the king. Whoever drinks from there shall live forever. Go quickly and fetch me some, and I too shall drink. The servant hastened, cup in hand, to bring some of those waters to him. 
but he could not find them. He returned, he returned and told the king, I could not find the waters of the river for the Lord has hidden them from me. The king grew angry, drew his sword and beheaded his servant. Then the headless servant ran away. Menahem explained this to the king who said, apparently this is the gate of the garden of, of Eden. Then he cried out, who is open this gate? A voice called back. This is the gate of the garden of Eden and no heathen or uncircumcised male may enter. That night, Alexander was circumcised and his physicians came and immediately healed him with beneficiary herbs. Nothing of these was known in the camp for the king ordered his physicians to keep silent. The next day, the king cried out to the keepers of the gate, give me a tribute and I will go on my way. And of course, this is the explanation why Alexander here is, is circumcised. Despite some differences between the narratives, uh, in the tale, uh, in, the, in the later tales of Alexander, birds are revived instead of fish, and there is no mention of Alexander's ablution. These stories come from a common stock of stories in which Alexander played the active role, anointed in the water of life and eventually approaching the Garden of Eden. In order to enter, he accepts circumcision, which admittedly is not enough to bring him inside paradise, but it is sufficient to make some Jews claim him as one of them, or at least as a writer's tzaddik, according to a tradition first recorded by Flavius Josephus in his account of Alexander's entry into Jerusalem. Considering that the fountain of life, Alexander himself taking hold of, the, of, of its water, its nudity at the spring and the circumcision, all details present on the bowl, we cannot propose a better explanation for this image than a Jewish version. There were many ways to evoke Alexander, but indeed, the Fountain of Life is one of the few episodes to which the Talmudic literature paid attention. On the bowl, Alexander is depicted twice. The second scene, Alexander's, Alexander collecting frankincense with his own hands, is probably reinterpreted according to the Jewish and then Christian image of the Lord's anointed king or prophet. Alexander is king and being divinely inspired, he is assimilated to a prophet. Finally, taken as a whole, the composition cannot but call to mind the Garden of Eden with the two figures on each side of the tree, the snake and Alexander picking up the incense balls exactly as Eve picked the apple. In the period when the bowl was produced, Jewish and Christian ex exegetics um, works were beginning to locate the Garden of Eden in the south southeastern ends of the earth, which means somewhere in India. Yeah. The bar chested Indian servant carries a precious liquid, which in our interpretation is a perfumed water from the fountain of life brought to Alexander. He has a solar symbol tattooed on both sides of his chest, which is consistent with his function of servant of the sacred wood of the sun and moon, as well as with the Indian practice of real or fake tattoos. The monstrous Indian drum player some, somehow calls to mind the priest of the sacred wood described in the letter to Aristotle. I quote, the priest of the oracle appeared. He was more than 10, ten foot in high, with a black body and with the teeth of a dog. From his pierced he ears hung pearls and he was clothed in skins. I have already compared his appearance with that of a monkey. This is in line with the Greek tradition <coughs> about the writers yet monstrous people of the Sinocephaly, 
located in northern India, who were not actual dogs, but humanoids with dog's teeth. Aristotle identified the cynocephaly with baboons, a species <coughs> which, fits, which fits well uh, the Greco-Egyptian imagery of temple servants. In Roman times, baboons uh, lived in Hermopolis in the temple of Tot, the moon god, where they were treated like scribes and diviners. A cynocephalus priest beating the drum was therefore an appropriate figure to illustrate the oracle of the sun and the moon, awakening both distant Egyptian echoes of the lunar cult and more familiar ima Indian image. Now to the Jewish background. There is plenty of testimonies on Jewish communities in Central Asia at that time. In the fourth century AD, the Jewish community in Merv was visited by a religious elder from Babylon, who admittedly did not find them very orthopractic. Direct archaeological evidence has been found in Merv in a 5th, 6th century cemetery with osheries bearing Aramaic inscriptions. Altogether, Jews were certainly numerous and influential in the Heftalite Empire, as shown by the contemporary folk etymology in the Byzantine historian Agathias. Instead of Heftalitai, he writes Neftalitai, the Neftali, one of the lost tribes of Israel. This is the first uh, witness of that story of the lost tribes having found their way in Central Asia, uh, a story which was still recorded by uh, British travelers in the 19th century who took it directly by, uh, from the Afghan leaders. In the early Islamic period, well established Jewish communities are documented in Merv, Herat, the mountains of Ror, Maimana, and Balch. During Heftalite times, perhaps more than before, India was reached by Central Asian traders. There are some indications that these traders included Jews. A few inscriptions in square Hebrew and the upper Indus have been found next to Sogdian inscriptions. The earliest textual testimony of the presence of Jewish traders in Southern India is uh, Ibn Khurdad Bey's notice about the Ravaniya merchants in the ninth century. Ravaniya meaning probably those who know the way. Two of their trading routes linked India with China through Central Asia. One, one went uh, up the upper Indus to the southern Tarim Basin, and another route uh, went through Samarkand to the northern Tarim Basin and Turfan. As suggested to us by Pavel Lourier, or bowl manufactured in Bactria uh, might well have ended in Tibet through this channel. In which language was the Alexander Romance accessible to 5th, 6th century Jews in Bactria? and more generally to Central Asian peoples. The Jewish elites knew Aramaic, and the Talmud passage is in Babylonian Aramaic. Syriac was mainly used by the Nestorian church, but some Jews probably understood this cognate language, at least orally. For everyday use, Jews spoke local Middle Iranian languages. The question of a now lost Pahlavi version underlying, underlying the Syriac version and part of Ferdowsi's sources on Alexander is disputed. Michael Schenker has recently demonstrated that at Panjikent, a painted cycle from the 740s illustrates the Faromars Narme, an epic which drew much of, of its narrative material from the Alexander Romance, thus making it even more probable that stories from the Romance itself circulated in the Sogdian language. 
We have also evidence that in the eighth century, uh, in the seventh century, a Sanskrit ver Sanskrit version of parts of the Alexander Romance were circulating in India. Uh, for the, 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 one of these stories about the Amazons is mentioned in a poem by the Indian poet Bassa at that time. Final remarks. Sometime in the late 5th or in the 6th century, in the Heftalite Empire or, or in a successor state, a dignitary or a rich merchant, most probably a Jew, imbued with Hellenistic culture through the filter of other languages, felt it appropriate to evoke the fabled Indian countries while expressing in his, his attachment to the memory of Alexander, protector of his religion and his people. Here, it is appropriate to mention a bowl found at Chiliac near Samarkand, on which the portrait of a Heftalite ruler is set in the middle of a harem of ladies of a markedly Indian type. They are primping or dancing. And this is obviously in order to manifest the appropriation of these Indian countries. And actually, there are close stylistic similarities between this object and the Lassa bowl, especially in the design of cloaks and scarves. One can wonder whether the Jews in Bactria did not associate themselves with this, with this Heftalite propaganda, using the theme of their Alexander taking possession of the treasures of India in order to show him as a forerunner of their Heftalite masters. Thank you for our attention. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Franz, for a wonderful talk and also a very detailed uh, analysis of the, the, the pictorial schemes and content on, on a bowl like that. Um, as I'm waiting for, for some questions to, to trickle in, I had a couple of more sort of general questions in, in terms of the production of these bowls, for example. Um, are they all, I mean, most of the examples that you, that you noted that, that share these analogies, are they seen as being produced sort of in, in Bactrian context and that's sort of uh, from the where sense. they kind of spread? In the broad sense. Some of them carry uh, owner's inscription uh, in Bactrian, mm -hmm. some in Sogjan. Uh, these inscriptions probably... Uh, seldom uh, belong to the original owner. Right. Um, so they were credited, but um, uh, stylistic analogy uh, show uh, uh, that they were produced, I would say, in Bactria in the broad meaning. Uh, in, um, from the 6th century onwards, there is a kind of... Uh, aristocratic continuum between Bactria and Sogjana uh, under the Heftalite and uh, the Kiderite and Heftalite hands. And there is also a continuum with Gandhara. And uh, some of these boats could actually have been produced in Gandhara. Mm -hmm. uh, the question of uh, uh, the precise place of production is in a way meaningless in this period because uh, the, the purchasers were them, they, they were mobile. Mm -hmm. they, they belonged to the Hunnish upper stratum of the Bactria Sogjana. They moved and most probably the skilled artists uh, moved as well. Okay. Um, uh, one thing is sure it was a large production because uh, now we know more or less 20 specimens. By shape, they are quite standardized, but uh, the iconography is always original and um, ne never are two objects produced by the same hand mm. and probably... Um, nor in the same workshop. So, there, and, and what is your opinion about um, 
so so these were these were produced for individuals. I, I individuals individuals yes. and and used in aristocratic banquets. Right. One can drink in these books. Right, so contrary they were like personal to personal to cups and personal bowls for... Contrary to the Sassanian plate, uh, you can't eat nor drink in a Sassanian plate because it is decorated <laughs> inside. Right. In these bowls, uh, you can drink because it is plain inside. Uh, you can drink and you are forced to drink because they have no ring food. So typical, typically, they were used in aristocratic banquet either to empty a toast or to pass from one guest to the other, as described, for example, in Persian poetry. Mm -hmm. um, there are two, two questions. I have, I have one more, uh, if I may, in, in, in terms of the, the Jewish context um, in Central Asia, uh, in terms of objects that are, that are produced, perhaps, or, or connected to, to the Jewish cultural environment of Central Asia. When you look at sort of the archaeology or the, the, the art of Central Asia, um, are these sort of uh, depictions unique in that context, or, or do we find more now, uh, examples of Now that? we are sure of the Jewish belonging of that bowl. Well, first, this is the only bowl in the series of 20 uh, which uh, is definitely Jewish. Mm -hmm. uh, some bowls are plainly aristocratic. Uh, some have definitely Zoroastrian overtones. None seems to be Buddhist. Uh, and um, uh, we, 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 we think now that maybe two, two plates from later periods, 7th, 8th century, identified, um, attributed by Marshak to Christian communities, might be Jewish as well. Mm -hmm. one, shows, uh, one shows the, the fall of Jericho, and another one, uh, King David and Solomon. They could be either Christian and Jewish, and now, but the only reason probably why Marshak did not propose to recognize them as Jewish is that there was no, no uh, unequivocal example of a Jewish uh, uh, vase, but now there is. Mm -hmm. All right, so Peter has a observation. Uh, he writes, I'm struck by the resemblance of the quote, priest figure's head to the profile portraits of Alexander on Eastern versions of Greek silver tetradromes. Can you read that? Uh, I can't read. Uh, <laughs> uh, so he's talking about the, the, the facial features of the, the head or the head, the figure of the, the priest, the head of the priest. Uh, on the bowl uh, resembles profile portraits on, of Alexander mm -hmm. on Eastern versions of Greek silver tetra drams, coins. Uh, it's so-called bar bar barbarized. Uh, this, um, the priest, well, if I can show again the image, mm -hmm. uh, maybe I share the screen again. Uh, the priest is quite is quite monstrous. Uh, I, I, I am um, contrary to the two figures, the two nude figures on both sides of the tree. Uh, I wouldn't. Excuse me here. Uh, yes. Uh, well, uh, yeah, here. Can you see? Yes. Yeah. Uh, he's definitely not completely human. Uh, I wouldn't wouldn't compare it with uh, tetradrax with portraits of Alexander with portrait of Alexander. Well, of course, some of these later some of these local versions of tetradrax more later imitation are in a very crude style. And uh, they could eventually look, well, one could say, say, say that uh, 
King Heliocles, the last of the Greco-Bactrian kings, sometimes has a face like that. But this is just uh, this is just the crude side of the coins. Uh, when you, co you compare this one uh, with the, the ones we consider as Alexander, see also this one with his trimmed hair, it's not, it's, it doesn't look as a Greek, but Alexander, Alexander really looks like Alexander. Uh, Alexander statues or even Alexander coins. Give him, a, give him a lion cap, for example, for example, and he would pass as a perfect Alexander, profile of Alexander. Um, this is a question uh, from Matthew. On the bowls, where does the motif of the serpents climbing the tree and eating the bird eggs come from? Could it go all the way back to Mesopotamian, Anzu, or Itana? Epic. It could. Uh, um, uh, these snakes are depicted in another um, a fragmentary bowl, I think. No, no, another bowl, which doesn't belong to this series. It's a, a Sogjen bowl. Um, um, this could be multifunctional. In, in this case, definitely, um, it shows the cycle of life and death and death, cycle of life and death, because the, the snakes have to be considered in relation with, 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 with the fledging. Sometimes they are just born. Sometimes they are ready to fly to 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 to, uh, to take a flight. Sometimes they are absent in the nest. Most probably, the snake has eaten them. So uh, it, the idea is to show that uh, uh, the access to the to the treasures of the um, holy garden of aromatics is dangerous, is forbidden. Uh, the snakes actually, uh, some Greek versions of the romance mention uh, in this context, uh, mention snakes, not precisely snakes climbing on trees, but they mention, they mention that uh, uh, the, the, the aromatics are defended by snakes. And as I said, it is a very commonplace folklore motif about uh, 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 about India, you you find it in all descriptions of India, uh, be them uh, Arabic, Chinese, Sanskrit. There are always uh, everywhere you have uh, an ar uh, 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 an aromatic tree. It is guarded by snakes. So I would say it shows. It's a way to give a certain local touch, Indian local touch to the story. And at the same time, it has a symbolic meaning uh, that these, these aromatics uh, cannot be access, accessed by everybody. And, and most importantly, of course, they are reminiscent of the Garden of Eden. These snakes is ultimately the state, the, the snake of temptation. The, the, when you compare with, uh, as I did, uh, when you compare with, uh, can you see the screen? Yeah. Uh, yeah, look at that. Third, fourth century. Mm -hmm. it, is, it is very close to our image. You have the snake. The gesture of Eve is exactly the same as the gesture of Alexander gathering frankincense, and both are nude. Uh, only the pool is missing. I agree that ultimately, uh, there, remotely behind, there could be Mesopotamian mo motifs. Uh, the, the story of Etana, for example, is clearly the ultimate origin of the motif of the bird Garuda abducting a lady, which was studied by eventually by, by Giti Azarpai 
in a, in a, in a masterly article. Uh, and and uh, uh, it appears on a Sassanian plate, probably with some Zoroastrian reinterpretation. Of course, the, 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 the stock of Mesopotamian image uh, continue, is still at the background of much what is produced in the art of Central Asia until a late period. Yeah, the the narratives about about snakes guarding um, very lucrative trading items is also quite interesting because, of course, you have these types of narratives, mythological narratives, um, about uh, the the guarding of gold and other types of resources exactly. that become these these very broad. Um, uh, tales that are told almost as if, you know, to kind of make the, the, the product very exclusive, but also sort of off limits to, to a lot of uh, sort of ordinary, ordinary. And, uh, and, and probably uh, uh, to discourage potential treasure hunters. That's right. Yeah, that's what <laughs> we talked about that once in class, uh, lo looking at the story of the griffins that, that guard exactly. gold. Exactly. Um, I know it's very late for you, but I have... Um, oh, it's okay. <laughs> well, I'm alive. Thank you, thank you. Um, I just had a, had a general question about the, the Alexander romance, because it, it is quite fascinating um, how sort of, you know, centuries after the fact, this develops this legendary character and also um, the, the, the myth, get, you know, the legend of Alexander gets expanded and then translated uh, all across uh, Eurasia. And, and what I thought was really interesting uh, is, is the idea of localization, you know, how these, these narratives then get, get um, um, reconfigured or rethought or, or adopted and, and adapted to um, um, individual mythologies or individual sort of mythic uh, environments. Um, so what are your thoughts on, on, on the, the, the popularity and the movement of these, of these tales? Um, what, what is the secret to them? Was it just this, this was such an um, an, uh, an important the, the, history the, yeah. in, in the Middle East and, and Central Asia that it became part of sort of as soon, the as, soon as soon as one uh, looks seriously into the Alexander romance, one discovers it is a complete mess. <laughs> <laughs> because, uh, well, of course, we have very, we have uh, masterly and very convenient. Uh, um, uh, editions, translations now, but one must keep in mind that they are always they are always a composite and compromised text. Mm -hmm. uh, it, uh, this edition, this translation we have now, the most authoritative uh, and the most widely used uh, by uh, English speaking readers is Arzusa St uh, uh, of David Stoneman. Mm -hmm. uh, this never this never gives a, a full text which existed under in, in this form. They they, they they are they are composite. Uh, it's uh, as soon as we have any trace of this romance, which third century AD, uh, it's it's already it's already multiple. It, it, it multiplies into various branches, which eventually are recombined, adapted. So sometimes in these adaptations, you can detect a, a particular cultural trend. The, the first versions are, are definitely Greek, but quite um, uh, in, in the form uh, in which they were transmitted to us, which is most often uh, we uh, the, 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 we use the the version beta it is already early byzantine so there is a christian touch already very early um, the the greek and uh, uh, very very soon also uh, there is a greek version called gamma uh, 
uh, which has some Jewish elements in it. Very, very early, the Jews appropriated the, tra the transmission of the Alexander romance. Not, of all, not, not all versions, but quite often, sometimes. Um, uh, we have the, the Syriac version is, is definitely Christianized, but at, at the same time, it contains some specific traditions about Samarkand, which could only be gathered there then, especially these stories of Alexander having founded Samarkand, built the city wall, uh, built the temple of Nana. And in the light of these traditions, we could understand, we, could, we can confirm the intuition of the rush of the Soviet archaeologists that these small terracotta heads from Samarkand actually depict Alexander right. as the local hero. So uh, uh, it's multiple. The literature on the Alexander romance is now is, is huge. Right? You lost you you lose counts when 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 when, when you look at it. Um, uh, plus, uh, then it's appropriated. Uh, the, the Iranian versions uh, are a tradition by themselves. It starts with Ferdowsi. It goes along with Nezami, uh, and. Uh, um, Nizami somewhere states that uh, in compiling his version, he has made use of Jewish traditions. Mm -hmm. And uh, quite interestingly, now we realize that uh, uh, the most, uh, the, uh, Ale the Alexander is never uh, more prophetic as a uh, than he, as he is in a Nizami's version. The, the most mystical present, uh, uh, presentation, the most prophetic presentation of Alexander is in Nizami, Iqbal Nami, and he's the one who states that he has made use of Jewish versions. Right. Wonderful. Well, uh, on that note, uh, there are no more questions. Um, it was really wonderful. The article, actually, uh, oh, when I ahead. prepared this lecture, uh, which was due to be delivered uh, in person in yes. uh, December, our article with Anka had not yet appeared. It was not yet But published. it has now, right? But it is now appeared. Yeah. Yeah, it is in the last issue of Bulletin of the Asian Institute, uh, it, it, of course, in far more detail. Uh, yeah, right. I, I, I think I gave the essential here. Yeah, no, so uh, check the Bulletin of the Asia Institute, uh, the most recent Shoot volume. Last one. Yeah, uh, you will find the uh, and it is not yet article. On, it is not online. No. It is not yet online, but... <coughs> I can send a PDF to anybody, any, anybody who, would, uh, who, would, um, uh, who would ask for it. Okay, that's very generous. Thank you. You can send it to me already. <laughs> yes, of so I'll, be, I'll be the first. And we'll have um, plenty of occasions to rediscuss all of that uh, next year in Berkeley. Sure, uh, and, and I'm sure and I will by be. By the meantime, and can I have I, I, I still progressing on the series of the battery and bowls, uh, I can tell you that our last discovery is uh, that one of these bowls, the so-called Kustanai bowl in the Hermitage, mm -hmm. which was supposed to be a patchwork from various tragedies of Euripides, uh, is just one tragedy, Oedipus the King, Sophocles. Mm -hmm. Right. And uh, well, to Indologists, I, I can say that uh, it, it obliges, it, it compels now to look at the, to look again at the issue of possible Greek contributions to the emergence of the Indian theater. Mm. Lovely. Yeah, it's, that's popular, a very interesting topic. It's yes. not popular with, with Indologists, I know, no? but uh, uh, now we have to face the facts. 
No, and it's also a very interesting conversation that needs to continue, um, at least. So uh, looking forward, looking forward to that. And yes, Franz just mentioned he will, um, if uh, everything goes well, uh, be in Berkeley in person uh, next year, spring 2023. So we very much look forward uh, to that visit and um, hope you stay well. And thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and we'll talk to you soon. Uh, to everyone else, thank you for joining us. Uh, Frank Sky, thank you for taking care of all the logistics. Um, and hopefully we'll see some of you in person next week um, when Judith uh, Lerner is here to give her talk um, at the uh, uh, Center for Silk Growth Studies. Thank you so much. Goodbye. Bye. See you soon. Bye.